Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining in for this webinar. I hope you and your family are safe inside your respective homes and I wish you all good health. My name is Vipul and I am the marketing manager at VWO. I'll be your moderator for today. For those who are hearing about VWO for the first time, VWO helps you identify leaks in your conversion funnel and provides tools to fix those leaks and keep your revenue growing. So before I introduce our guest for tonight's session, uh, let me inform you all that today is our 10th anniversary. Uh, Wingify, the parent company of VWO, has turned 10 today. Uh, and that means VWO too has been serving online businesses for 10 years now. So it's a happy birthday for us all and we all uh, are excited today. We all had fun today, uh, although remotely, but we had great fun. Uh, this has all has been uh, possible because of your cons consistent support and I, I request you all to keep supporting us as we move further in the journey of helping businesses build better online experiences. Uh, with that said, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, Kenya Davis. Uh, she is the Senior Manager of Decision Science at Evolitex. Uh, she was previously leading conversion optimization programs at Lois, a Fortune 50 company. Hi, Kenya. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Ripple. Thank you so much. And happy 10th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. So yeah, before I hand over the mic to Kenya uh, and start with the presentation, uh, I just request every one of you that do ask your questions during the course of this presentation using the questions panel in the GoToWebinar section, uh, I mean, in the GoToWebinars panel. And uh, we will take all your questions and we'll try to take all your questions towards the end of the webinar. Uh, I have already seen Kenya's presentation deck and there are a lot of insights. So I know you will be having, you'll be curious about a lot of things. So do post your questions whenever you have one. Uh, I think with that Kenya, let's begin. Alrighty, thank you so much. And to everyone, thank you for attending and welcome to my webinar on unpacking information for inconclusive results. Um, I would like to first start with a little bit about myself. So we will um, dive into that first. I have a background in um, applied, applied physics. Um, my concentration is astrophysics. So I come from Discovery Place, Merce Line, Lowe's, and I'm now at Evolytics. Um, as a senior manager of decision science, that basically means that I develop these creative strategies for testing, um, and I dig into insights for optimization. So um, it's a breadth of, of knowledge in that field, but um, it's very rewarding. So I'm super excited to dive into how I've um, developed this step-by-step -step on unlocking and conclusive results. So, Let's dig into what you can expect to get from this presentation. Um, first, I would say that I want you to be able to identify and label the types of inconclusive results. Um, along with that, I want you to take away three steps and be able to um, apply those to some sort of checklist for yourself and your business um, and learn how to pivot the narrative of your roadmap. And lastly, how to relay next steps to your leaders and your peers. So why does any business test? Sometimes we, the business, make big investments under the impression that we really know our customers. With that knowledge, we tend to veer towards finding cost-effective ways of delivering high-performance um, experiences with optimized business processes, product enhancements, and whatnot. Um, so I'll call that reduced cost. Next, um, I would say taking a risk is one of the more higher um, rewards amongst businesses. So if you're often that company that takes a risk, um, you're expecting a lot from it as well, but you're investing a lot as well. For revenue, I'd say that's probably arguably the top reason that we test. However, uh, shifting revenue, driving factors to different channels can serve as a problematic task. So that can be resolved through testing. Customer satisfaction is probably the staple amongst all of these. Um, and it can be what makes and breaks a company. And lastly, gaining insights is definitely something that's a pillar within your post analyses. 
regardless of your testing reasons. So now that we know, you know, why we test, let's get into popular ways to test. So as many of you know, you probably have seen user research, observation tests, canary tests, and AB and multivariate tests. Just the level set though, let's brief, briefly run through those meanings. Sometimes we need that face-to-face -face or direct feedback from our customers. So this can be done in many ways with the end goal being that you've walked away with one of those golden eggs or a few golden eggs versus a variety basket of uh, hard-boiled, colorful, or whatnot, however you want to describe your features. Next, we can sometimes face tight deadlines or simply not enough foot traffic um, to gain confident conclusions. So the best way to look at that type of information is to run an observation test. Tracking and documenting these types of trends can be a very strong reward at the end. Um, and it's better to do that rather than run a weak standalone test. Probably the most uh, favorite amongst engineers, I would argue, is the canary test. So it's never a good idea to just dump the code into production without extensive testing. So this type of performance testing can be uh, one of the best forms in conjunction with many of the other types of testing. And then lastly, one of my favorites is A-B testing and multivariate testing. So this is what we will focus on today. Um, and this form of testing has skyrocketed to the top of digital efforts. Um, as many of you have known, it has uh, boosted these experimentation teams. Um, I'm sure you've heard the term CRO and whatnot. Uh, these types of testing methods um, are still something that's being discovered. So it's quite um, amazing to see how it's impacting the marketing and product management worlds. So with each of these, basically in a nutshell, you can always expect to get inconclusive results regardless of which form of testing that you're choosing. So in order for us to unpack how in order for us to unpack these results, we'll need to look at a case study for today. So this case study, I will let you know, it is called the Snuggly Bear Company. It is not a real company, but this is a real case study with real facts. So we'll start with identifying our company. Then we'll define the 2020 goal. Next, we'll call out the observations we know about our customers. And we'll run through our roadmap, narrow it down to about 60 days, from that 60 day scope, we'll identify our first A-B test series, and then we'll run a test. And lastly, uh, we'll actually unpack it in multiple ways, and we'll jump into the results and, and have a guess at why it could have come back inconclusive. So let's run into some company specs. The Snuggly Bear Company has about 50K products, and that includes stuffed animals, customized stuffed animals, keychains, and um, some clothing materials for your bears. The top five selling categories are bears for tots, bears for bereavement, bears for love, big bears for big needs, and birthday bears. The average order value is around $86.02. And, and some of the highest add-on items that we've noticed are special notes, gift wrapping, and clothing accessories. And lastly, the average purchases per year is around four orders per user. So now that we've identified our company, let's go ahead and do some observations. So what do we know about our customer? Clearly, we know quite a bit. So in conclusion of all of these insights, our customers are returning to us on multiple special occasions each year and typically purchasing one to like a few bears for a child or for a few children at a given time. However, there doesn't seem to be a value in signing in since guest checkout is exercised more than signed in users. So uh, now that we've made this conclusion, let's think of a practical goal. So our company would like to focus on the customer loyalty program. And they want to launch this for across the course of the 2020 year. We're basically wanting to go from this basic experience to 
this much stronger experience. But to do so, it will also take a lot of changes. And as you may have guessed, testing and lots of different forms of testing to get to this look and feel. And additional to that, there may be new KPIs that we'll discover along the way. So our, cust our current customer account has um, a pretty basic look and feel. Um, our customers account for users is merely a place to like add basic information that lives in a very, very large table. So let me show you the experience. It might be a little easier. So a customer comes to the website, they sign in, and it just says hi. There's nothing else, and then the customer can shop. So once they log in, say they drop down the carrots, then they can click my account, my bears, my list, and help. The only thing that they're able to do within these different fields is make alterations to the basic profile, look at the bears that they've purchased in the past, create and edit the list um, and indicate whether they want to bump or, or delete the list. It doesn't show them whether any of these bears are in stock anymore or not. And it's kind of a bad look and feel um, in terms of navigation. So uh, the last thing that they can do um, is file a claim or talk to an agent. And that's about it. So looking at where we are now, where do we want to be? The new perks program is something that involves quite a few um, additions. And with all of these additions, obviously it's not a uh, roll completely out type of feature, but uh, we want to offer the customers, you know, a step-by-step -step, uh, introduction into all of this. So it's important for us to outline the overall goal and address the areas you, that we know um, that need to be tested. So each of these areas could cause ca cataclysmic roadmap meltdowns, but still, I mean, we must dream. So for our perks program, we want to offer a personalized look and feel to the customers, for the customers, and eventually. Uh, with that, we'll have them basically shopping more with us. And the more that they shop, then the more that they'll save. So to get there, the roadmap, as briefly mentioned before, is the key. So we'll look at tiers one, two, and three eventually. So now that we have our 2020 goal defined, and you've been able to see what the overall goal is, Let's go ahead and look at our roadmap. Beneath your goals, it will help to assign the types of testing that you believe can answer the appropriate questions. So the current customer account, it may help to eliminate a few defects before diving into testing and create a baseline performance dashboard or um, use something that can allow you to compare as you move along your roadmap. And to do so, it's recommended that you um, do this as observations and or canary tests. Take those uh, baselines and use them to compare as we go along. So if we look at our current customer account, it may help to eliminate those defects, as we mentioned, but also we'll want to um, parse out how that experience can be done. So we listed out quite a few things that we want in our end goal, but to get there, as I mentioned before, A-B testing in a series may be the key. So we'll add each step and then we'll add what type of testing. So to keep our focus on just the 60 days, as mentioned, we're just gonna use this piece of the roadmap. Um, and this branch, it may be 60 days or more, but of course, like I mentioned, you're going step by step and you're taking into account the, the points at which you can see some type of major shift. So now that the roadmap is actually created, let's look at the first test series that we wanna focus on. The roadmap basically can be created and now it's uh, created by these grouping of these questions, but when we're looking at the test series, it's important to parse those test series questions and two hypotheses as well. 
So for the first test series, we'll focus on revealing the new perks to a group of customers. So here's what we'll include in the first test. So we have the current, which is our control, and we'll call that A. And then for B, this is our grouping of perks that we are gonna move forward with for our B variant. So that would be free shipping, 5% off special promotions, shipment tracking and recommendations carousels. So let's see how it will look for the customer when they're entering into these uh, tests. So the A group will, will get the normal um, experience on the website and our B group, as you can tell, will get this new banner that calls out the new perks program. And it's calling for them, a call to action for them to sign up. But not just, you won't just see this, uh, this call to action at this point. If someone did not see this banner, whenever they click the login and or sign up, it will also trigger what we'll call our pop-up experience. So whether you click on the banner or whether you click login slash sign up in the top left corner, you'll get this pop-up action that's calling out these, these uh, points that you'll get whenever you sign up for the new perks program. And then our buttons below of new sign up, login upgrade, or the no thanks will give us some type of insights into the intention once the customer does get here and has seen what the upgrades entail. So the current account users will be measured based on upgrade rate with a few secondary KPIs like site conversion, average order value, and revenue, time spent on site. And equally for the new users, they'll be tracked on sign up click through rate and site conversion, AOV, revenue, time spent, et cetera. So now that we have the first test series all together, uh, let's look at our first test. So this is exciting. Um, I'm sure all of you have been here before. You're running your first test and you believe everything is set up right. You have your KPI, you have your goals, it's clear cut. Um, the experience has been QA'd and we are just ready to go. All right, so test is in flight and we have our variant new perks program engine running. We have our control group running and we are excited and ready to go. We have some data filtering through. However, we're nearing completion and we notice that the conversions are drastically different from the control experience in a negative way. So they're, they're even worse than they were before. So then we do a little bit of digging around and we look at our control and we realize that it's dropped more than 25% on average month over month. So what on earth could be happening? So for context, this test was launched on February 25th and we're gonna run this all the way through to April. So although it may seem like the obvious thing is to chalk it up to COVID, probably the best thing to do is to be patient. Let's think about this. Let's unpack it in stages. So now we are at the part of unpacking our test results. Um, I will say that it's better to make sure you're ruling out everything before generally um, saying why something is inconclusive because there's a lot of unforeseen things that you can run into, um, code changes, um, global changes, new customers, all of that in combination could be the reason as well. So. Um, this three-step process will be something that you can turn into a ongoing checklist, even if it's not for your inconclusive results. So as I mentioned, before we chalk up the inconclusive results to COVID, even with the impact dates lining up, it's still important to rule out everything. So let's quickly look at what we mean by inconclusive results. Um, there could have been test load errors, disproportionate samples, site outages, or, or just simply confidence um, just wasn't met. So um, we'll want to really make sure that we're, we're attributing the issue appropriately. So as you all have been waiting for, let's get into the step-by-step. -step. Um, as you all can see, there's three portions that we'll want to look at. 
You'll want to check yourself, start unpacking the data, and then pull out your tools. So if I start with the check yourself, what does this really mean by check yourself? You can do this in any order as you please. Um, this can be done by either checking your setup, validating your original parameters, or validating other test collisions if you're not using swim lanes. So I don't wanna simply put these points here and then have you try to interpret them. So I'd like to align these to um, some examples from our bear company. So what exactly would this look like? Let's say that when we set up the test, it was set up here, meaning the customer was um, exposed to the test only upon clicking login or sign up. This would be done basically uh, with the test being set up at this layer of entry. So the customers have already entered the site and then they are assigned to a test or not to a test via clicking login or sign up. What we would have wanted was for this test to fire before the customers enter into the site or at the point of um, entry. And we'll call that our A site versus our B site. So the A site would have no banner, no pop up, and the B would have exposure of either clicking the sign me up and getting the pop up or the login and sign up and getting the pop up. But no matter where they entered into uh, onto the company site, this global banner would always show and it will always give them the opportunity to click um, either the banner or the login or sign up. So now that we've ruled that out, let's move on to step two and let's start unpacking. Now I will say that a lot of times you can get hung up on the step one um, if there are setup issues and depending on what platform that you're using to run your test, there may need to be more um, investigation into how you should be setting those up. So if you're running a test for the first time, um, I would recommend starting with just an AA test so you can eliminate um, that part of the process or running into that type of problem. So with starting unpacking, we can look at a few points here. And like I said, it doesn't have to be any particular order, but these actually can run um, concurrently in your investigation. So data first would be did the analytics fire? Identify as how are the high and low converting segments um, behaving? Next, we could look at uh, the areas of the highest and lowest converting traffic or just the highest and lowest areas that, are, um, that have traffic flowing through the site. That could be channels, that could be uh, paid channels or whatnot. Uh, site health, uh, that is very imperative to a healthy testing environment. If you're having site outages, um, that can greatly impact the loading capability of your test or the experience itself can look a little jumbled. Uh, and then lastly, the goal. Was your goal too large or was it too narrow? Um, did it match the hypothesis? Was the KPI matching? That type of analysis isn't necessarily you um, changing what the KPI is or changing what the goal is. It's assessing whether the test really answered that question. So like I did before, let's run through some quick examples. So if we're looking at data first, um, a good example of that with the bears would be the unique identifier for the tests were not implemented by the developer. So users were qualifying for both the control and the variant sides of the test which is not a good thing. Um, if we look at the identify section, then there were biases in the segments or users who already had an active account. Let's say that they automatically went into the new parks roster and did not actually have to click the upgrade button. If we're looking at locate, Northern US states converted higher and we know that they also were hit harder with COVID-19. If we look at site health, let's say that the site was down from 3 a.m. to 8 a.m. for one of the peak traffic days or maybe for an entire week. It'd be very relevant to know this and understanding why you may not have met your sample. And then lastly, as we mentioned, the goal, 
the metric for uh, the test was set to fire um, for site conversion instead of site sign or for, sorry, not site, but customer sign up and upgrade rate sign up. So now that we're moving on to the third step, before I reveal these, I will say that um, this level of unpacking is very valuable, but make sure that if you're spending this much time unpacking inconclusive results, there's truly something that will drive uh, your roadmap into a huge fork in the road. And by unpacking this information, it means that you're not going in blind, but you're going in at least with trends or new information um, that allows you to tell that story and that narrative of your customer's behavior better. Uh, so going into our step three, this is pulling out the tools. So <laughs> we all have a tool belt for A-B testing and that's your, you know, your platform that you're using, your team, the expertise of your team, um, the post and pre-analyses, uh, the monitoring during the test, all of these things are encompassed in your tools. Uh, but there's also these other tools that help you to unpack things that are not um, visually apparent. So that could be like a chi-square tool, a z-score, and really digging into that, um, checking your confidence calculator, looking at multiple confidence calculators, um, validating the logic of the KPI chosen. So does it even define the goal? And then lastly, I would take this... Uh, very cautiously. So external and third party data correlation analysis um, will have to really be from credible sources. There's a lot of media that's um, that's churning through multiple channels. Um, so if you're going to pull that information to compare to your own data, your own tests, be sure that you're pulling in something that is very, very credible. So I would like to go into examples of these as well. For statistical tools, if using chi-squared, uh, you can reveal categorical relationships. Um, that's pretty much the, the strongest thing about it. Um, there's also flexibility in adjusting confidence and power levels along with examining your z-score. Um, if you're looking at statistics and you're wanting to compare your models, um, I wouldn't necessarily say questioning the confidence of the models is the best thing to do, but as a much larger scope, maybe having that conversation is good to have um, at a scale for the entire testing program. And I would I would like to close that with trust your data teams and trust that they can empower you with that knowledge um, and the tools needed to tell that story of, you know, which confidence models should be used. Um, if your KPI is wrong in terms of how it's defined, when it fires you as the owner of its analytical power should really think of redefining it. Um, you'll be setting up the business and everybody else who will fall in line um, for success. So be sure that you're taking that responsibility and ownership of what your KPI is and how you are telling the story of your customers. And lastly, um, our most cautious area <laughs> when looking at external data from world events, much like COVID, you should be very careful of how it is integrated into the story. Um, this is why it's important to run out all of the reasons for your tests being inconclusive. Also, your test could be inconclusive for multiple reasons, as we mentioned before. So it could just be a combination. So it could be a setup error and external data. Um, it could be that uh, your customers are not able to access a certain portion of your site, which would have greatly affected um, your ability to, to measure the sign up rate, especially if it was a high traffic page, along with external data and whatnot. So now that we understand how to unpack the data and have done so, should we pivot the narrative? Is it even, is it too soon? Um, should it involve more people? There's a lot to, to really understand here. So before we pivot, let's look into why we would even pivot. So here's some examples on why the Snuggly Bear Company would or should pivot. One test is not enough to pivot, but if the behavior and needs of your customers have changed so dramatically 
that the business is now making company-wide changes, then it's a fair uh, chance to alter your roadmap. So I'll go directly into this example. Um, the, Bear, the Bear's new account test was the first of its series and a great way to start identifying what's valuable for our customers. Real situations though are hitting this company like the Bear's arriving well after the, the patient has passed away or uh, they weren't reaching the hospitals in time or the, or the hospitals received them and they couldn't actually give them to the patients because of um, social distancing. And although this is a very um, sad example, it is a very true one and very relevant. And no matter how big or small your business is, we have noticed that they have all been impacted. So if I look at um, another reason to pivot in the form of the data or the KPI is not sophisticated enough, um, this could be found honestly during the, stu the step two process, which reveals the lack of proper tagging or validations. Um, it could have been caught there that the action that's um, firing this KPI is not the actual action that you're observing. For our original roadmap, um, it, it's going off of the insights of what we have found for our customers. So um, sometimes using something like the Chi-Square tool can reveal those new uh, groups or those, not necessarily even new, but groups that you have not really identified by that deep dive analysis that's needed. And then lastly, um, high performing products, which we've all probably seen before, um, they could drastically change as the customer's demands and needs change throughout um, their journey through the year or whatnot. So something like high sales on Christmas and Valentine's Day could peak to have the same value for the the duration of covid where we're seeing an increase in bereavement bears so now that we understand why we would pivot let's look at one of the pieces of our roadmap so before it was are people more willing to sign up based on new program perks and now it's connect a deeper reason to becoming a new customer then observe the customer behavior for the next 60 days because we have a lot fluctuating. It's not just traffic, but there's feelings and emotion and, and clicks and anger and frustration. And people are calling your, your call centers and they're trying to figure out what to do here. So it's okay to, to input something like emotions or behavior that's very hard to articulate with KPIs um, into your roadmap as well. And don't be afraid to use a cluster of KPIs to tell that story. Uh, partner with your data team. As I mentioned before, they, they can really give you those insights into what pairings go well together to tell that story and that narrative. So information to leaders. We all know that they are very patient individuals, um, but let's face it, time is money. And with that, we really want to make sure that we're not wasting anyone's time. So Depending on how much time you have to unpack your data, upon learning about the test results being inconclusive, there's a few things that you should already start doing. Define the time needed for the analysis. So depending on how difficult your test is to unpack, either communicate that that's one day, two days, seven days, whatever's needed. Um, and I would, I would definitely partner with the person who's doing the deep analysis to make sure that they are giving you the proper uh, timeline as well. Draft and send that right up to your stakeholders on the current situation, partner together, do stand-ups, um, and send consistent communications along this process. So that's like your day one, your 0%. Halfway through your analyses, you should either know that it's either something in step one or know that it's something in step two and you're getting to that um, conclusion or you're considering step three. You're considering really doing that deep dive. Um, and by now, since you know this, uh, you just start looking at, do I have a data problem? Do I have a business problem? Send that to leaders and update on next steps and potential impact to your roadmap sooner than later. And then upon completing um, these, this three-step process, now that you've identified your problem, whether you have an answer or don't have an answer, you still have to come out of it with some sort of action. So how will you do things differently and how will you get the support of your stakeholders 
um, it's, it's imperative that you document this and make sure that it's something that either is adopted into your digital community and is something that everyone is able to reference, or um, you can be that, that speaking voice of, you know, I thought this was a simple test and it turns out to be something that's quite uh, complicated or complex. Um, then you can just pivot your roadmap to more attainable goals and communicate that. So the point is to stay ahead of the questions. Now, lastly, as promised, uh, the example communication to leaders. I'm sure many of you on the line are not new to that. So what I've found to be very successful is to not only tell them uh, what you found or what's the, um, the things going wrong, but tell them the things going right. Tell them the learnings in a way that, that, that shifts the narrative into here's how we were gonna do it and how we thought we would make uh, and revenue impact, but here's how we can do it differently and still make that same revenue impact. Um, so if I think of the call outs, I really wanna go through these points with you guys. Um, if we've eliminated the setup and data issues using the step-by-step -step process, then um, make sure those are also documented within the communication to say, hey, you know, we checked the setup and it passed. We checked the tagging and it passed. We checked uh, the segments and looks like you know where the test was located everything was has passed um, and then we dove into the deeper analysis tools and they revealed this really new exciting thing so if we pivot the roadmap this way then we'll still be able to get our answers but we now are becoming more sensitive to the customers behaviors for the solution piece as i mentioned they don't just want to hear the problems they want to hear the solution as well um, so leave out the unnecessary overly detailed A-B testing jargon. If you're not sure what it means, don't put it in there. Um, I found that that can just stir up confusion and sometimes people get hung up on the little tiny numbers, the, the tiny numbers that may not be as relevant to the story. So really focus on, on what your goal is and, and keep that as the, the jargon piece. So digging into our takeaways now, um, prepare your roadmap to align to attainable goals that allow time for proper testing. Um, I know that we're moving a million miles a minute, but there is value in allowing that cushion time for when you do run into these inconclusive results. Will you have time to dive into a deep analysis? Maybe lining up your tests in, in ways of if A wins versus B, then we'll go on to C. And if C versus D wins, then we'll move on to E. The gaps in between those, make sure you're, you're giving that time to really digest what you've learned. And even more so than that, give the time for your data to really level out. Then if you do run into inclusive results, follow the three-step unpacking process in the order. Um, document and share the learnings with your digital community. Make it a stand up and, and call out what you found. Then that culture of inconclusive results is better uh, received. And respect the knowledge of your data teams. They can help you target those big wins with a deep dive analysis. Lastly, communicate to your leaders along the way. Don't have them reaching out to you with questions. It is never a good thing to be in the principal's office for something that you could have uh, addressed or something that you could have found out within some certain time frame. If you know three quarters of the way through your test that you're running into some inconclusive um, roadblocks, go ahead and, and share that narrative and say, hey, you know, I don't think things are going right. So we're gonna start unpacking our test to figure out what's going um, well or what's going wrong. And if something can be run, uh, concurrently that still answers another question that may not be related to the one that you're trying to address now, then save the time. Go ahead and run the other one. Make sure that you, you're checking your setup and use some of those unpacking tools to make sure that the tests that you're running moving forward won't run into the same issues. All in all, 
It's a lot, I know, but don't worry. Inconclusive results are normal and can be caused by literally anything. If every test came back conclusive, whether accepted hypotheses or not, then scientists wouldn't need so many testing cycles, so many testing animals, or hopefully not testing animals, but uh, testing samples. Um, it will sometimes take, honestly, multiple tests and perspectives to really find an answer. Uh, questions may not always just be that one for one approach. It could just be like five tests in combination um, that, that give you that story. And then lastly, always remember what is proven applies to what was observed during that time. Applying the same test to different users at a different time, or even the same users at a different time, can yield completely different results. So every test has an expiration date. If you're not aware of your expiration date, simply grabbing the experience that you've run the test in, adding that into your post analysis will give a really good perspective on when I ran this test during this time, this was this action was relevant or this conversion uh, was predictable in this way because of these different parameters in the environment. But now that we've maybe shifted everything, there's these buttons don't exist anymore. These colors aren't there anymore. This this flow of the process doesn't exist anymore. That's very relevant um, when you're looking at your results. And if you're basing them off of um, an experience that technically is a phantom experience, then you may want to relook at the pre-analysis phase of your of your testing and your roadmap to really think about what's needed for you to understand your baseline. All right, so thank you all so much. Um, I hope this was very, very helpful. If you need any help at all with new testing and optimizing your business um, tools or, or help of any, any way, please reach out to me and the Evalytics team. Um, I've put a few links here so you can contact us. There's a website, um, the, the calculators I mentioned, Z-score, uh, Chi-squared, all of that. You can find it on that link of A-B testing calculators. It's extremely um, interesting. And I would also recommend that you look back at some of your past test results and filter them through some of these different um, uh, processes and see if you uncover anything. It could be really insightful. So I hope that was everything you're hoping for. And Vapul, I will hope that you uh, have some questions for me. Yes, yes, I'm back. And uh, I was very closely listening to uh, what you were mentioning in your presentation. And I really, really liked, uh, and I'm being very honest, I really liked the clarity of thought there, uh, Kenya, because uh, I haven't seen in many presentations wherein, you know, uh, sort of the structured approach to testing is discussed and you included all those points in your presentation so that was really really you know a delight to listen i would say thank you so much for that <laughs> thank you <laughs> great uh just building on this point and, and uh, the question i had was you know structured approach to testing not a lot of businesses follow it right but many businesses want to follow it uh the, v, the reason that we at VW recommend it because it reduces the probability of you know running into inconclusive tests. So do you agree with this or what point do you have? What thought do you have on this? Um, in regard to structured testing, um, I kind of chalk it up more to structured experimentation programs um, and, and less of like on the test itself because if you have those right checks and balances along the way, um, it honestly sets up every test that deploys um, up for success in terms of being conclusive. And you can even go into it knowing mm, we may or may not get a result based on how we, we have our, our team set up. And to give you an example, um, I've worked uh, past clients where, you know, there's a pre-analysis done and the pre-analysis includes checking tagging and checking um, the flow of the customers and checking out outside um, data that's you know not just your internal company's opinions and data. Um, that alone has helped to kind of shave off tests that work and don't work, or tests that are biased, or 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 tests that don't really answer that question. And although that seems like a tedious process, 
and that is mm-hmm. part of that structuredness that you're that you're speaking to. It's something that um, really allows everyone to feel more empowered. And although it it does kind of bring back that ability or kind of cut that ability to run a lot of tests, a lot of tests isn't necessarily the best thing to do. Um, quality versus quantity is always going to be a winner, um, I think, for anyone that's in testing. Right. So that's that's <laughs> that's a really important point. Uh, the the evergreen debate of quality yeah. versus quantity. Uh, I've been an audience to a lot of webinars, and I've been to uh, been a participant of many discussions internally as well, wherein uh, some people are of the opinion that you should test more. Some people are of the opinion that no, you should test less, but you should test the right things. So there's always uh, there's always a debate around this. Uh, that keeps the team's sort of morale high because everyone's contributing yep. and yep. feel empowered, of course. And uh, so that's a great thing. Of course, so you have to, uh, I would suggest uh, as a business, one has to figure out for themselves what works best and then take a decision based on, you know, what the team agrees on. So that, that would be a very diplomatic answer, I would say. But mm-hmm. yeah, uh, you have to find for yourself what works in your respective yeah. business. Great. So I'll, uh, there are a couple of questions and actually a lot. <laughs> and I'll start taking them one by one. Uh, the first one I'll take is from Kuda. Uh, okay. So Kuda is referencing to a test that they are running in their own organization. So they're asking, we have a test and in this test variant B, was winning, but not statistically significant for two weeks. Uh, For example, 80%. Usually we consider this as inconclusive. So in such a case, what would you suggest them to do? Um, In that case, really there's there's a lot to look at. If if normally conclusive uh, results are around 90 to 95 for that page and that same KPI, then I wouldn't necessarily use those results if it, it's just stopping at 80%. I would look back at what variants um, I'm looking at, what's this distinguishability of it. Um, and I'd honestly jump straight to step three. I know I said don't skip through, but if you know these the setup and you know that the KPI um, is always the same and the page and location is the same, um, there's clearly something else happening there. Um, now, if it's like, you have two tests prior that reach 95 or 99, and this one has 80. Um, you may altogether want to look at what your what your level of confidence should be. Right. Uh, hope that answers your question, Kuda. Uh, I was actually looking. I was actually reading a, another question, which is again uh, a real example of the test that they must be running uh, on their own website. It's a, it's a bit long one. <laughs> uh, it's Bill Gerardo. I'm um, sorry if I'm taking the norm, uh, I'm pronouncing the uh, name wrong, Gerardo. Uh, he's asking, I'm currently running a multivariate test and my main KPI is conversion rate. So let's say that I've identified that I followed the three steps and everything looks okay and that the full test has run through the COVID season from March to May. If my results still lack uh, statistical confidence uh, between 83 to 85%, but results haven't changed uh, much during the last weeks and, and we haven't identified patterns or commonalities in the winner variations, should I stop testing or declare a winner now? Or should I uh, you know, keep running the test? So there's there's a few ways to look at this one. Um, and if I'm understanding it right, um, mm-hmm. it's, it can, it's running through COVID and it has uh, consistently been between 83, 85% um, and the KPI is conversion rate, correct? Uh, sorry, could you please repeat? I was actually reading another question. No, oh, no, you're fine. Um, I'm pretty sure I've got any saying once you get through the three steps, um, what should you do at that point? I would say that, um, as I mentioned before with the last one, if you're always peaking at the, the higher end of your um, confidence being around 90, 95, 
break down that test. So if, if it's not giving you the answers, then maybe somewhere within that funnel, there's, there's some type of variation happening, happening along the way that's causing some type of um, unsurety or uncertainty um, for the calculation of it staying around 83 to 85. So I, would, I wouldn't necessarily say turn it off um, if it's possible to run it concurrently with um, a much more specific test that's slightly under the KPI of conversion rate, then that will give you a little insight um, between the groups of at what point is it starting to really vary. Right. Uh, that makes sense. Hope that answers your question, Gerardo. And if it doesn't, of course, uh, feel free to reach out to Kenya directly after this webinar or yeah. Evil Ethics. Mm -hmm. Right. And I will and, say that uh, usually there's a lot more time spent on on a lot of these questions. So if, if like right, you said, this, have more questions, yeah, right. I can see, I can see, I can understand the concern behind this question. And of course, it cannot be answered within a minute or two. Uh, this needs a lot of explanation from both the ends. So yeah, Gerardo, mm -hmm. do reach out to Kenya or Revolutics directly, and uh, feel free to uh, you know share your uh, problems with them. Uh, cool. Uh, Okay, I'll pick this one. Uh, the next question is from Kerry. Kerry Wilkins. Uh, she's asking, what is the most common reason for an inconclusive test, uh, given the examples that you've listed? Um, I would say the most common that I have seen, based on the ones that I've listed, have been. <laughs> it's it's the easiest and the worst uh, thing is setting it up at the wrong point. So firing it at the wrong time. Um, as we went through that first step where it said the person set up the test of fire at login versus, and sign up versus the site level, what that means is that the customer, all of the customers, um, you can call that the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, client side version of testing. Sorry. Uh, and if we look at the way that this test should have been set up, because they're getting two completely different sites, it should have been server side. And I know that's the argument of client versus server side, but really it's a logical thing. Like you want to have both. There isn't an either or type of statement with it. Um, it's more of what, what gives you the ability to measure even site conversion at the end of those. Um, if you have one that's their whole website is consistent, their experience is consistent, they're sprinkled promotions in and out, they're sprinkled this and that, but they're all tying to one unique program, then maybe those people need a completely different website experience than the ones that are not seeing any of that. Um, and I've seen that it's it basically boils down to how should the test be set up? And I've seen that run for weeks and arguments upon arguments and and it almost being settled by just setting it up different ways, that that being an experiment of itself. Right. Makes sense. Uh, I'm just looking at the time and I have uh, I have space for just one more question. Uh, so I actually wanted to know, uh, <laughs> since you've worked for uh, Lois and it's a, it's, a, it's a very big company, of course, needs no introduction. <laughs> So I just wanted that if you could just share a few examples, maybe without any sharing any specifics of any inconclusive tests that you ran uh, and that you ran into while you were at Lois. Um, there, there were many in the beginning. Right. Um, the beginning as in the beginning stages of the experimentation program and i'll keep it very broad because i'm not i don't really want to you know dish out any of the specifics um Definitely. but i would not say that when it came to areas where um you know lowe's has a lot of foot traffic they have a lot of customers and customer types and they have that luxury of looking or running many tests at one time um Without the use of swim lanes, almost every test seemed to be inconclusive unless it was homepage because the experience, you're able to get in and out of Lowe's experiences so easily and there's access points all over the website. 
it's extremely important to isolate those experiences. So um, that was, I would say, the highlight of inconclusive results were if there were other impacting campaigns or impacting tests. Okay. Yep, thanks. I, I completely understand it would be yeah. very helpful for you because it's a I'm really sorry. big company and we both wouldn't want to run into issues. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I totally understand that. Uh, perfect. So, yep, thank you so much, Kenya, for first of all, you know, making this amazing, insightful presentation uh, and sharing your expertise with our audience today. I'm Absolutely. really, um, yeah, I'm really glad to have you and I'm sure the audience must have loved uh, every bit of it, uh, whatever you shared. Uh, and of course, be, uh, guys, feel free to reach out to Kenya uh, if you have any questions, right? And uh, yep, Kenya, would you want to direct them uh, to an email address or can they connect with you on LinkedIn maybe? Um, yes, so they can contact me at um, either LinkedIn or, let's see. Yep, that's fine. Just connect through LinkedIn and what I'll do is I'll pivot you through to the appropriate person within Evalytics depending on the question. Sure, uh, uh, just search for Kenya Davis. Uh, you'll find her definitely, <laughs> right? Perfect, uh, so thanks again Kenya and thank you everyone as well for attending this uh, session today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something uh, new and interesting. Uh, do fill in the survey that will turn up once this webinar is closed. Uh, your feedback will help us a lot uh, going forward. And of course, uh, do attend, do look out for uh, our future webinars. Uh, we have another one coming up in the next two weeks and it will be based on uh, copywriting and using copywriting as a conversion influencer. Uh, the webinar will be hosted by Rishi Rawat. He is the founder of uh, Frictionless Commerce. So do check out uh, vwo.com slash webinars and you'll get all the information there of all our past and upcoming webinars. And yep, definitely you'll receive email notifications whenever we have new webinars in line, uh, just like we did for Kenya's webinar as well. Great, uh, have a great day everyone and Kenya, you too, have a good day. Awesome, thank you, you too, bye.